All right. Welcome, everyone. This is class number three, Lent, Prophecies and Realities. Every time we're looking at an Old Testament prophecy and seeing how it was fulfilled in the New Testament, which, as we've been saying for a couple of weeks, completes the story of our salvation and helps us grow in appreciation. So let's say a prayer. Lord Jesus, we can't say thank you enough for all that you do for us, especially when we look at what you went through during Lent. Help our appreciation be off the charts, that in all things we gladly serve you. Bless our time gathered around your word. Amen. All right, getting started. Imagine I give you a ride to the store. Are you thankful? Sure. I give you a hundred bucks and don't expect it back. Thankful for that. I watch your kids for a week for free while you vacation in Jamaica. Thankful. I give you one of my kidneys. And once more, thankful. Figured out where we're going with these questions. Well, each time the intensity wrapped up and the bigger something I did for you was, the more thankful you are. Well, none of those things hold a candle to what our Savior has done for us. So as we said in the prayer, may our thanks and appreciation be off the charts. And with that in mind, let's jump back in. The prophecy was the Messiah's clothes would be gambled for, Psalm 22. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Now we're back in Psalm 22, which might be the clearest messianic psalm of the 150 of them. Excuse me. Messianic psalm meaning it points us directly to the Messiah. This psalm so closely resembles what happened to Jesus that sometimes we read it at the end of a Monday Thursday service as the altar is stripped. If you ever saw that, uh, people come down, somebody will take the communion wine, someone will take the bread, someone will take the candles. We completely strip the altar, which symbolizes Jesus being alone and deserted. And once more, this is a very specific prophecy. They divide my clothes, they cast lots for them. So did it come true? Luke 23, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Matthew 27, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. So Psalm 22 made the prophecy. Did it come true? Yes, it did. And notice where they did it, at the foot of the cross. To me, this seems to show the callousness of these soldiers. They were Romans, likely guys ticked that they were stationed way out in the boonies. They didn't care about this guy or the people. They were just doing a job. And one of the perks was that they could keep things that once belonged to their victims. To them, this was just another day in the life of a soldier. If only they had known who he was. And we talk about their callousness and we wonder, how could they be so callous? I mean, right in front of a guy who's dying, they gamble for his clothes. Well, I guess the question is, how can we be so callous when we give in to temptation? Maybe these guys didn't know who Jesus was. We do. Maybe they didn't know what he was doing. We know what he did. So before we point the finger at them, let's point it at ourselves and say, Lord, forgive me for the times I've been so callous and just willingly walked into temptation. Next, the Messiah's bones would not be broken. Exodus 12. It, the Passover lamb, must, not, must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. In Psalm 34, he protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Now the prophecies, these, the verse from Exodus is talking about the Passover lamb. Before the Israelites left Egypt, God told them to celebrate the Passover. This was to be a yearly reminder of what God did in letting them go free, and even more so a foreshadowing of Jesus' work. Just think about it. They were to kill a young male lamb, one without blemish or defect. None of its bones were to be broken. And the blood of that lamb spread on the doorpost meant the people in that home were saved. Now, clearly, this is pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God. And once more, note Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper at Passover. The time of looking ahead was over, for the true sacrifice was here. The whole purpose of Passover was to get people to look ahead, but they didn't need that anymore because Jesus had arrived. The psalm then ties the two together, making the clear point, Jesus is the Passover lamb. And yes, not one of his bones be broken. And the reality, but when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. As promised, the Messiah's legs were not broken. Breaking legs was a way to speed up the crucifixion process once the victim had suffered enough, depending on what, how you define that word. Without support from their legs, they could not hold their heads up to draw breath and would die of suffocation. We don't know the exact medical cause of Jesus' death. could have been one of many things. But the important thing is that he did die, and he died as Scripture promised, with unbroken legs. It sounds simple, but do you understand how horrible crucifixion was? 
you've probably heard me say this before. I once read a doctor's account of crucifixion during a sermon, and I'm never going to do that again because by the time they got done, half the congregation was crying. Uh, it's so brutal talking about how organs shut down, there's exposure, and then there's just the mental anguish. You know, we see the pictures with Jesus with a few drops of blood on his head, and it doesn't look that bad. Reality, though, I don't think we can understand just how horrible it was. And the whole point of it, too, was to be assigned to everyone else. Don't mess with us. Or this horrible thing will happen to you. Messiah would be forsaken by God. Psalm 22. Back to that psalm again. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And you're probably getting sick of hearing this, but notice the preciseness. The exact quote Jesus made was prophesied. The Messiah would feel totally alone because he would be totally alone. The Messiah would feel totally abandoned because he was totally abandoned. The fulfillment. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, just look at that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As promised, Jesus did cry out these words. And what did he mean? On that cross, Jesus became our sin, and he became us, a sinner. Sinners and a holy God cannot mix. Luther said they go as well together as fire and hay. Since Jesus took our place, he had to endure all we should have endured. Since we deserve being cut off from God because of our sin and losing every bit of grace he can offer, Jesus had to face the same thing in our place. As St. Paul said, he became poor so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. Love, forgiven, and welcome in God's family, you can't get richer than that. Jesus was forsaken, so we never would be. And why did Jesus say this in Aramaic? Wasn't the New Testament written in Greek? Well, Aramaic was the language of the common people. Greek was the language of the empire. After Alexander the Great went through, he Hellenized the area. So everybody knew their local dialect, but they also knew Greek as well. It's much like if you do worldwide business today, you have your own language, but you need to know English. Everybody knows it. Same thing with Greek. People spoke certain languages at home, um, but the language of the empire was Greek. And the Messiah would pray for his enemies. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I am a man of prayer. Now, without contest, this would be taken a lot of different ways, but the point is clear. Enemies are acting terribly, but the victim prayerfully handles all this. And the reality, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In the reality, the Messiah did indeed pray for his enemies. What an amazing example of Jesus' love and grace this is. Jesus praying for those who crucified him while they're in the process of crucifying him would be like you praying for my forgiveness while I'm actively punching you in the face. It's not that this was done and he said, oh, forgive them for what they did. They were in the process of doing it. Now, your first thought and mine, if roles were reversed, would be to protect yourself and fight back. If I was hitting you, you'd protect yourself, likely with vengeance and anger in your heart. Not Jesus. He came to fight, but his fight was not with people. His fight was to save people. Thus, he went to war, but war against sin, death, Satan, and hell. Now, Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, who could the they be? Well, frankly, the they could be everyone, including us. And did they really not know what they're doing? Well, maybe the soldiers didn't know exactly who Jesus was. But we do. And so when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, that extends to us as well. And we thank God that it does. So in closing, I know we've wrapped up a lot of these classes or videos with talk about thanks and appreciation. You know why? <laughs> because we should be ridiculously thankful. We should have it coming out our ears all the time. The best thing ever have, has been done for us. It took tremendous love, courage, and sacrifice. Yet this is what our Savior did for us. So to end on the theme we started with, thankfulness, thankfulness, thankfulness. And that's what should we, our focus should be as we get closer and closer to Holy Week. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments, please let me know. Be glad to help in any way I can. And we'll wrap things up next week. God bless.